Who doesn't love some good Southern barbecue? College Park, Georgia, on the outskirts of Atlanta, is home to Michon's, a family-run barbecue restaurant. It initially enjoyed success as Al, the patriarch, was a skilled restaurant operator. But things took a sudden turn when Al's health deteriorated, forcing him to stay away from the restaurant. He had hoped to have his daughter, Natalie Michon, after whom the restaurant was named, take over control of the restaurant. Unfortunately, she hasn't shown the same skill or dedication as her father in running the place. The restaurant began cutting corners, such as preparing food days in advance and then reheating it in the microwave, rather than cooking it fresh on the day of. Is there anything today that I ate that wasn't microwaved? The salad. You fucking donut. Even worse, Natalie seems somewhat oblivious to the problems plaguing the restaurant. As a result, she lacks a respect of the staff. Well, I think it's fine, but that's right. Your name is only on the building. Get it right. The quality and standards have declined at what was once a fine establishment, leading to unhappy customers in a struggling restaurant. Pretty soon, the family found themselves more than two hundred thousand dollars in debt. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what a shame they were trying. <laughs> Welcome to the shine. Before Ramsey heads to the restaurant, Al requests an off-site meeting first. There, Chef Ramsay learns about the problems plaguing Michon's. However, he's curious how Al has kept up with the situation while being homebound due to a collapsed lung. Al reveals that he continues to monitor his restaurant through a network of surveillance cameras, 18 cameras to be exact. Ramsay is somewhat surprised by this revelation. Ramsay then visits Michon's to see the problems firsthand. He is warmly greeted by Natalie and her mother, Gay. When he inquires about Natalie's role in the restaurant, she mentions she handles HR and tends to stay in the back a lot. This response takes Ramsey aback that someone whose name is on the building would be taking such a casual attitude to the whole situation when they are $200,000 in debt. Natalie feels upset by what she perceives as disrespect in her own restaurant. Following that brief but somewhat awkward introduction, Ramsey decides to sit down and sample the food for himself. He is greeted at the table by a server, Tadisha. Ramsey flirts a little, complimenting her on her hair. He ain't never seen a beautiful, thick black girl like me, so that's what that was. When Ramsey asks Tadisha about the number one issue facing the restaurant, she immediately cites management. However, she draws a blank when Ramsey inquires about Natalie's exact role at the restaurant. Eager to sample the cuisine, Ramsey decides to order a bit of everything except for the potato salad, which, Tadisha informs him, is no longer offered because the chefs dislike peeling potatoes. Ramsey is taken aback by this, but before he has time to ponder further, his first dish arrives, the smoked chicken wing, purportedly made that morning. Although he enjoys the sauce, he finds the inside dry. It's soon revealed that these were actually yesterday's wings, confirming Ramsey's suspicions that they weren't prepared that day. His next dish, a gourmet salad smoked chicken, comes with rotten tomatoes. This revelation, however, doesn't seem to surprise Tadisha in the least. Have you seen the kitchen? Yeah, they don't care. Following that are the ribs, which both look and taste dry. The cornbread, really dry, like the Sahara Desert on the plate. Then the black-eyed peas, which he describes as hideous and shocking. They are so bad he orders Tadisha to take a seat close her eyes, and try some. What the hell? I don't want to eat that. Our food is nasty. Sure enough, she concludes that the black-eyed peas are indeed pretty nasty. Ramsey questions how a barbecue place like this could operate in Georgia, commenting that he feels more like he's in prison than a restaurant. He moves on to try the last of the dishes. The baked beans taste unmistakably canned, lacking the homemade warmth one might hope for. The collard greens, grossly far too sweet for his taste, fail to hit the mark. Meanwhile, the brisket is so chewy it could be easily mistaken for beef jerky. After his disappointing lunch, Ramsey heads to the back to meet the staff who prepared his meal. To his surprise, he finds the kitchen crowded with more guys than he can count, yet astonishingly, not a single one seems to be in charge. This lack of leadership has him immediately questioning, without a head chef, who then bears the brunt of responsibility for the dismal state of the food. What'd you do here? I'll smoke some meat. It turns out that nothing was actually smoked that day. Everything Ramsey ate was microwaved. When he asked Terrell if there was anything he ate today that wasn't microwaved, Terrell quips the salad. 
After the lackluster lunch service, Ramsay returns later on for the dinner service. In the kitchen, all he hears is the constant beeping of microwaves. Yet, what catches Ramsay's eye is the staff portioning meat and other pre-cooked foods inside plastic bags, a method he has never seen before. Ramsay then heads to inspect the meat smoking process. He discovers two perfectly good $17,000 smokers, which he believes could be utilized much more effectively than their current process of pre-cooking in batches, bagging, chilling, then reheating in the microwave. Unsurprisingly, after he learns about this method, he understands why dishes are flooding back to the kitchen, with complaints about the food being dry. Back inside, Gordon's inspection of the kitchen reveals even more issues. In the walk-in, he finds tubs of smoked wings, estimating there could be a thousand wings or more. Mortified, he dumps all 1,000 wings out in the kitchen for the staff to see. After this shocking display, Ramsey pulls Natalie aside for a one-to-one -to, -one to convince her to change her ways, but he encounters defensiveness. The next morning, Gordon gathers all the staff to reflect on the past 24 hours, with Al and Gay watching on a hidden camera in their office. The staff unanimously agrees that the restaurant lacks a true leader. Since Al's departure, it's been a free-for-all, with no real structure in place. Natalie listens in silence, seemingly taking the criticism to heart. Ramsey then takes her to her parents in the office, where she commits to taking responsibility. With leadership established, Natalie appoints Terence as the kitchen leader, who is ready to take charge. The next step is to revamp the menu. Ramsey overhauls it, and the staff is eager to try the new dishes. Just before the tasting, Ramsey introduces one last surprise, Chef Adam who is trained under Tom Colicchio, will assist the restaurant for the next month. Nice to meet you. I'm ready to eat. I'm looking at all eat? this food and I'm oh, ready to oh, eat. Dig in, dig in. On the night of the relaunch, excitement fills the air as a line forms around the block. The evening begins with high hopes, but it isn't long before the kitchen becomes overwhelmed with orders, causing delays. In a moment of quick thinking, Natalie devises a plan to offer guests tours of the smokers, effectively buying the kitchen the time needed to catch up. Her strategy works, and the kitchen regains its pace, allowing the evening to conclude on a high note. Natalie appreciates Chef Ramsay's tough love, acknowledging it as a necessary push for her and her parents to see her potential for success. As the episode wraps up, the narrator reveals that Chef Adam remained for the next month to mentor Chef Terrence. Al feels a sense of relief, knowing his daughter is finally managing Michonne's with competence. We've obtained some unaired footage of a chicken wing eating competition that was hosted at the restaurant during filming that didn't make it to the final cut. Here, yeah. We've got some very hot chicken A local TV film crew was on scene to interview Chef Ramsay at the end of the episode. Just finished taping Chef Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares. We are on location at Michonne's. They have the most amazing smokers in there. Mm -hmm. um, so you walk into a smokehouse and you expect ribs, chicken and wings mm -hmm. to be freshly cooked. Yes. I had wings and ribs that were days old. Mm. I don't expect that here. And when you think of Atlanta, you think of Georgia, you think right. of wings, you right, think of right. barbecue, mm -hmm. smoked meats. Um, specialties, yeah. yeah but, so do you think they're ready now? Do you think they're going to be a, a good competitor where the smokehouses are concerned? It's family run. Mm -hmm. And finally, we've convinced the father to hand the ration over to his daughter. The passion's there, mm -hmm. but the staff were lacking direction yeah. and they had fallen out of love with their job. And you have to have that passion. Every day. Definitely. Every day. I can't wait to see the episode. Thank you so much for coming. Do not forget Kitchen Nightmare starts on the 23rd of September. Do not f*** 
f***ing miss it. <laughs> In fact, things were going so well for Michons that the family decided to open a second location, this time in downtown Atlanta. However, just two weeks after opening the new downtown location, a fire started in the ceiling of the building. Firefighters battled a blaze, but had difficulty and had to retreat from the building after the structure started to collapse. An Instagram account that showcases abandoned barbecue joints showed a photo of what the former downtown Michon's location looked like five years after the blaze. They added, a fire broke out just as employees were prepping for lunch in March of 2012. Fire totally destroyed the building and it has not been opened since. It was not long after that that things began to go not so well for Natalie in her personal life. She was arrested for theft by conversion in 2013. There are no other details about the case though. In 2014, the family announced that they had chosen not to renew the lease at their original College Park location. They were rebranding as Michon's Barbecue Bistro and would try their luck at a new downtown Atlanta location. Soon after, they even announced plans to expand to St. Louis to open a new branch of Michon's Smokehouse. This restaurant represents a homecoming for the family as they previously owned a barbecue joint there in the 1990s before relocating to Atlanta. The new St. Louis location at the corner of 10th and Washington was ready to go by the summer of 2014. The restaurant had all the signage out front. The interior was completely ready to go. The social media pages were all created. And finally, staff were brought in for training. However, it appears that they hit a bump in the road and the St. Louis location never actually opened its doors for business. It is unclear why it didn't open as Natalie or the family never made a public comment to the best of my knowledge. A server who was supposed to work there said, I wasted two weeks of my life driving and training there. I was promised a paycheck from the owner. I am not alone in this situation either. About 30 workers are in the same boat as I. Months later, I am still in the dark. I have now been forced to take legal action. Please support me and my fellow co-workers that have been lied to, played by, for not giving Michons your business. Meanwhile, back in Atlanta, their newly opened downtown location wasn't receiving the best reviews online either. A reviewer who had frequented the old College Park location featured on Kitchen Nightmares observed that the site was previously a Quiznos sub shop and it remained largely unchanged, giving it a fast food ambiance. Disappointed, she predicted the place wasn't going to make it. Most reviewers criticized the dry and bland meats, contributing to a mere 2.7 star rating on Yelp. In 2015, the downtown Michon's location closed, signaling the end of Michon's restaurants, although they continued to cater events. Sadly, in November of 2018, Al passed away. His online memorial page features a section for comments, where several Kitchen Nightmares viewers have shared their memories of seeing him on TV. The building that once housed Michon's College Park location was transformed into Pig and Pints in 2014, known as a modern meat and three offering classic Southern comfort food. Sadly, they only lasted four years, closing in 2018. Following that, the location then became an Ethiopian restaurant named Bulb, which enjoys considerable success and great online reviews. Regarding the rest of Michon's staff, Tadisha has stood out online for her classic one-liners in the episode. At least there should be more. Why would the best join? Because it's bootleg. Bootleg? Mm hmm They just don't care. She shared on her YouTube page that she became a mother at 14 and had six children by the age of 23. She proudly stated that none of her children became teen parents, a testament to her strength as a single mom. She mentions her appearance on Kitchen Nightmares and concludes with, Against all odds, I made it out of the hood. On Facebook, she announced that she has been happily self-employed for the last two years, finding relief in not having to work for someone else. Now residing in Chicago, her story continues to inspire hope. Little information is available online about Gay, apart from a LinkedIn profile which hasn't been updated in a while. Similarly, information about other staff members, such as the kitchen crew, is scarce. However, I hope they're all thriving in their professional and personal lives. Turning our attention to Natalie Michon Wilson, what has become of her post-restaurant closure? On her LinkedIn, she shares, After retiring from the restaurant industry, I sought freedom, and that is exactly what I found. I can show you how to earn a six-figure income part-time. After venturing into the travel and marketing sectors, she founded her own company, Airtight, the first document storage company designed to be user-friendly, secure, shareable, and empowering for those previously without a voice until now.
Then, in January of 2023, she launched Change Her, with a mission statement of Never watch someone else build an empire when you have the power to build your own. Michonne's conclusion reminds us to savor the temporary wonders of the culinary world.